We have talked a lot about already um, how in how far competition law and other areas of law like uh, like consumer protection, privacy, are getting entwined. Um, we have set up a, 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 a working group, a steering group, working group on this issue in the ICN. Um, and now we want to present you a panel on consumer law enforcement at the intersection between competition, consumer protection, and privacy that will be chaired by my friend and colleague Matthew Boswell. Matthew, the floor and the stage are yours. Good afternoon. I think uh, maybe the panelists want to come up, unless you want to hear from me directly for half an hour about various things. So perhaps I could uh, invite them up. Um, Ruprecht Podzen is a professor of law here in Germany at the University of Dusseldorf. Um, right here, it's great. Also an alumni of the Bundeskartell Amt. Waiting for the alumni party. Yeah, that waiting for <laughs> the alumni uh, party. This morning. Tembe. Beside Ruprecht is, of course, uh, Tembe Bonakale, who's the commissioner of the South African Competition Authority and has been, I think, since 2013. Is that right? That's correct. And uh, finally is a uh, gentleman some of you may have met uh, over the years, uh, Mr. Bill Kovacic, who's a professor um, at George Washington University. Uh, the com competition center there uh, leads that. Also, former chair of the FTC and a non-executive director of the CMA for many years, I believe. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. We have the after coffee break on Thursday time slot. So we're a bit time compressed and, and um, we're actually, we have some injury time that we're gonna, we're gonna use at the end because we're starting a bit late. Um, and I've informed my colleagues that we're gonna be using a yellow card and red card system this afternoon to make sure that everybody gets a chance to speak. So if you see me waving these around, um, it means they need to stop. Now, before we dive in, um, as, as uh, President Munt said, uh, this is a, steering group project that found its infancy in a discussion in 2019 in Cartagena and then was, was crystallized uh, after that um, to examine the, the ever increasing important issues with respect to the intersection between competition, uh, privacy and consumer protection. And a working group was created, and I want to take a moment, uh, because it's very important uh, to acknowledge the work that's been done, to thank uh, the Italian Competition Authority, uh, the ACCC, the Australian Competition Authority, the US Federal Trade Commission, and my colleagues at the Canadian Competition Bureau, who've been driving the work uh, since the project got underway. And as President Moon said, and as we've heard over the last three days, these issues are becoming more and more important, and there are calls for us to spend more time thinking about them and finding uh, solutions. Now, the working group has researched the topic thoroughly. Various issues have been identified from academic literature, and we've uh, inputted from, uh, uh, we've benefited, excuse me, from input from many agencies. We've done a survey in the ICN network to um, find experiences and uh, what agencies are thinking. We've held webinars where we've invited um, various stakeholders, academia, economists, think tanks, private practice individuals to give us their perspective. We're pulling that all together right now, um, drafting uh, what we're calling, I guess, a public agency considerations paper and that should be completed in the next few months. So we've come a long way. I think we've heard multiple people this week say we have a ways to go, um, but we've come a long way in understanding how these three areas intersect, why it's important and becoming more and more important every day, and considerations for the future. But today we're gonna to talk about real life stuff. Real life cases, two real life cases, and experiences from an agency in dealing with these uh, intersecting uh, areas in our, in our economies. We're very fortunate to be joined by these three excellent panelists who are gonna provide us with that real life experience and some insights on, on what we might be thinking about next. So with that, uh, we're gonna skip right to the good stuff and, and 
reminding my colleagues that we have five minutes each for your first uh, opening salvo. And Ruprecht, let's start right here in Germany. Can you tell the audience about uh, the Bundeskartellamt's uh, Facebook case? A very important decision, certainly in Germany and, and for uh, others around the world to consider dealing with this intersection of privacy and competition and a decision from your federal Supreme Court. So over to you, Ruprecht. Thank you, Matthew. Um, I'm a bit nervous, I have to confess, since being on the panel with Bill and Temby feels like being this singer-songwriter with a guitar before the Rolling Stones are going to appear. Uh, but um, I'll try my best. And I have good material at hand because the song I'm presenting is this Facebook song, which, which really is a landmark revolutionary case for, from the German Competition Agency. What the Bundeskartellamt did in that case, in my reading, Andreas Mund, please excuse all my simplifications that I'm going to use in the six minutes that you allotted to me, is um, what the Bundeskartellamt did was <laughs> saying if Facebook combines data from different sources, from their own sources, from Instagram, WhatsApp, but also with third parties, third party websites, they, the, um, they actually do something that we know from excessive pricing, namely exploiting customers. This time they don't exploit customers through high prices, but through a certain measure of exploiting using combining data. And for seeing what is the benchmark for saying this is an exploitation, what the Bundeskartellamt in my readings um, did was saying, you exploit your customers if you, at least if you violate the law, namely the European uh, General Data Protection Regulation. So, so that was, in, this is, as you see, a one-liner on, 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 on that case, which led many people to believe that the Bundeskartellamt actually applied the Data Protection Regulation, saying um, you violated the GDPR, and therefore, uh, since you're a dominant company, this is a violation of abuse provisions. I think it's a bit more complicated than that, because I think they framed it as an exploitative abuse case, which is a normal case under Article 102 uh, of the treaty. Now, the interesting thing with this, um, in my view, is that if we look at this, do we, do we have to do data protection rules or so in competition law application? I think no, but of course you have to take the facts of the case into account. And one of the facts that you are dealing with are the rules that you have. So if you look into a company like Facebook, if you look into the market environment, obviously you have to you have to do some data stuff. That's, that's the obvious thing. And for understanding what the limits are, what Facebook can do, what they do, you have to understand, of course, what the rules are that are applicable to this. So if, if people now say sort of they overstep their mandate, I think that's, that's, uh, that's wrong, since they have to take into account what's happening on the market. That's simply the, 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 the power of facts that you need to take into account. Now, the interesting thing about the case, you, um, you alluded to that, is that it took several court cases. It's still pending. Now is the Court of Justice. We, we've heard already that the Court of Justice in Luxembourg will hear it next week. But the Federal Supreme Court in Germany took the case and I think changed the the, the, the theory of the case a bit, and what they said was they took that exploitation bit that I discussed and said this is problematic not so much because it's an exploitation of customers, but because consumer choice is reduced what kind of product they wish to have. And that's an interesting statement because they say it's not a consumer welfare standard that we apply, but or the consumer welfare that we see as important is including consumer choice on different products. And consumers here don't have the true choice to have sort of um, a less data-intense product than they would love to as they would love to have. And they did a second thing that I find very interesting that is a bit in the Catalan's case as well. They said, if you exploit data, if you reduce consumer choice on that market, and if you are on a multi-sided market, what that actually means is that you start foreclosing the market for competitors because you get all the data, you have much better possibilities in advertising, etc. And so they drew, drew the link, which I found really important for, for these multi-sided markets, they drew the link from how do you treat your customers on the one market side and what does that mean on the other market side. And that was a really plain thing um, there as well. Um, now, the the other important thing, and I think this plays very strongly in the debate as well. I'll, I'll talk till you stop me, right? Yep. Okay. Um, so the, the other thing uh, that the Supreme Court did in this case was in the justification stage. So in Article 102, you usually somehow, in an abuse case, you somehow reach the stage of, okay, is this justified or not? What they said was, we don't only look at what's happening in competition, but 
here we have fundamental rights playing in because Facebook is a provider, an infrastructure provider of communication in society and competition people have to sort of be in line with what's happening in uh, fundamental rights. Fundamental rights say um, if you are in such a strong position to influence, to control how you communicate, what people do in their day-to-day -day communication with others, you also have to take fundamental rights into account, which is for my understanding, something which is a bit newish to the competition community because we often thought we are basically on this isolated island where you have nothing but competition law. Um, and, uh, and, and then they said, okay, they have a right to self-determine what they do with their data. And that's in our constitution. And so you please take that into account if you do a case on data and privacy issues. I think this was another very important, um, well, the pillar of this, of this Supreme Court um, decision. Okay, I, I that's could go good. On. Well, I yellow. <laughs> okay, then let me. You're then finishing me, early. That is no, 30 no, no. Seconds okay, left. wrap it up. <laughs> <laughs> My negotiating power is good. <laughs> um, <laughs> good job, Matthew. <laughs> So the, um, what, I, what I find interesting in this case, I mean, if we're discussing how do, how do we treat privacy and consumer protection and everything, I think the, the key concept that we have to keep in mind is how do markets function? That's actually the business you are pursuing. How do markets function? How do we make them function in a perfect way? And that means we have to look at how supply and demand work. And of course, supply and demand in the digital world work with data and with consumers. And this is, is a very simple fact that we have to take into mm. account. So there, I mean, Facebook is akin to government in that they have to they have to promote fundamental rights and live live by fundamental rights. Is that what the court was saying there? Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much what they're saying, and that's also in the European uh, Google Shopping decision. I think when they say Google is um, uh, Google is an ultra dominant company, so it's a bit more than just dominance; it's ultra dominance. Mm -hmm. And the uh, European court says if you're an ultra dominant company, you have a stronger responsibility, not just the special responsibility that we know from abuse cases, but it's even a bit more, and I think this all plays into the same direction. Okay, great, thanks Ruprecht. Um, let's turn to Tembe now to discuss, um, in a coincidence, the exact same company, but yes. um, a South African initiative uh, with respect to privacy and, and competition and Facebook. Thanks very much, uh, we'll do a quick, uh, presentation of the case before I hand over to the, the rock star. Uh, <coughs> this is um, uh, actually quite interesting uh, to come after Matthew because uh, we, as you say, uh, are dealing with the exact same company, uh, WhatsApp, which is a subsidiary of Facebook. But most importantly, the issues are also uh, strikingly similar uh, in that it's invoking some public public uh, uh, issues. Uh, we have uh, an abuse of dominance case, uh, which we have instituted. Uh, the case hasn't been decided. I think that's the, that's the difference. Uh, it's officially uh, being prosecuted before the tribunal. So take everything that I say as how you would take uh, what the prosecutor says. Uh, before the judgment. That's truth. <coughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in South Africa, what happened is that uh, there is a, a, a company that, so uh, in uh, sort of typical operations of uh, WhatsApp, they collect data uh, from uh, users, and uh, they uh, have a business uh, service where they, uh, can give business, serv business services uh, uh, an app which they can use to interface with their customers and so on. But there is this particular business that then took the, uh, uh, used the platform to uh, uh, create interface between uh, citizens and government. It's called GovChat. Uh, so uh, citizens can go into this business app, they can access government information, but they can also link government uh, 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 to the kind of problem so people can check their social grants or social security, uh, status, applications, healthcare during COVID was also used, this was used quite a lot. Um, you literally can report uh, potholes on the road 
real-time information, and government can, can act on that. So uh, WhatsApp decided that uh, they were going to offload uh, GovChat uh, from their business uh, platform, uh, and the case was reported to us as, a, as an abuse of, of dominance, as exclusionary conduct. So we've, we've looked at it uh, as such, and we've referred the case. But we are also invoking uh, some uh, data uh, uh, sort of uh, issues in that the data that is collected by, by WhatsApp uh, actually belongs to the citizens. And uh, also the, 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 cities, the, the, the consumers in this case, we're looking at their rights, uh, not from a classic consumer protection point of view, but more from a, from a, uh, from them as citizens, uh, that they they are sort of entitled to interface with government, uh, and 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 I think that uh, there are a lot of constitutional issues that are impacted uh, by this as well, um, uh, and as I say, it, it's going to be quite tricky. Uh, because we, we, we must still prosecute it and, and, and get into a finding. But it's encouraging that there is already a, a decision in, in, in Germany along uh, similar lines. Okay. Thanks, Tembe. And we'll, we'll come back to South Africa in a the second. The red card was meant for me, so I... I was uh, getting it ready. <laughs> <laughs> Nigel told me to get it ready. Um, so, so, Bill, you've seen these intersection issues up up front and personal for years, and you've been uh, you've been involved with the CMA's work to tackle them, to understand them, to find new approaches. Do you want to share that experience, uh, and maybe also, for the benefit of the agencies here, talk about some pitfalls or some hazards that that are out there? Sure, Matthew, and I I, I want to begin with. 20 years out in the experience of the institution, not just to thank you for putting the panel together, but to recognize the indispensable role that Canada played in the launch of the ICN. We wouldn't be here today without the dedication of you and your predecessors to do this. Wonderful analysts and, and case handlers like Nigel, who made this happen. Uh, and uh, again, without your durable, consistent, remarkable support, this institution never would have gotten off the ground. So a real pleasure to be Thank here you. with you today. You. Um, I wasn't expected. <laughs> when we look at our, our agencies, we talk of them often as competition agencies. But when you look at all of our membership, indeed all of the national competition authorities in the world, over half of them are multi-role multi agencies. They perform a function other than competition law. And the most popular combination around the world is competition and consumer protection. And many of these configurations go back over a period of decades. Uh, some of the most interesting experiences are the two agencies I know best, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, which is competition, consumer, and privacy. Uh, the other, the CMA, competition and consumer protection. I think what's interesting in their experience is that for the most part, the real challenge is to achieve integration across these domains. Simply putting all of the functions under the umbrella of one agency does not ensure that they'll work together. If you don't work through conscious structures and processes, you can end up with a conglomerate structure where you look like a company that owns a steel mill, uh, has hotels and sells tangerines, <laughs> and not a lot to do with each other. So the actual process of achieving integration is so important, and I'd just like to highlight a couple of things that I saw uh, with, uh, with great admiration that the CMA has done over time. One is the use of market studies as a way of achieving integration. A properly defined market study asks, what is the problem? What is the pathology that we see in the market? What's the phenomenon that deserves to be cured? And approaches it with the open mind that says, what are the causes? Maybe it's a consumer issue. Maybe it's a problem of inadequate disclosure inadequate consumer understanding of a problem. Maybe it's a competition problem on the supply side. But the market study, well developed, I think, is an excellent tool to identify underlying causes and, as a result of that open-minded pursuit of causes, to identify good solutions. 
That's one thing that I think the CMA did with great skill, continues to do today. So the market study is the foundation. Uh, second is to have a project selection mechanism inside the house that brings both disciplines together. It means that you have your consumer people and your competition people on the project selection committee so that in deciding what matters to give, a, to give a green light to, they're all thinking about solutions that bring to bear all of the capabilities. So instead of having two separate project selection groups, you have an integrated project selection mechanism that gives you a greater likelihood that appropriate solutions will be picked from both. Third is the habit of using public consultations to bring forward interested groups, citizens and others, to explain what they see to be the problem. If you do that, again, you're going to hear from business operators and from consumers information that often identifies for you the true underlying cause of the problem, and that public consultation process, again, attunes you to what the underlying concerns are, and it gives you an idea to reflect on how you can bring the full portfolio of authority to bear on the problem. And the last is to use cross-agency collaboration. Uh, I look at what the CMA has done with its Google Privacy Sandbox settlement. Not only did it achieve integration inside the institution, especially through a remarkable task force, a digital working group that has these disciplines represented together, but a remarkable collaboration with the data protection regulator and the communications regulator. Not simply an MOU that says we're gonna to work together, but genuine integration that involves staffing, support, and an ongoing commitment from both top leadership and down through the case handling levels. I think that that's a way that you bring to bear the full resources of the government, what we increasingly call a whole of government approach to problem solving. I think an, an institution that does those four things achieves the possibility of simply moving from the aspiration of policy integration to its realization in practice. Uh, I think a, 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 a caution in doing all of this, it's important for the agency to think on a regular basis about what it, what's its brand. That is, in 50 words or less, what are we seeking to do here? As you expand the focus, that can become a bit more challenging, but I think to ask oneself on a regular basis, what are the themes and considerations that make our institution distinctive, and what gives us our focus over time? Uh, the broader the expansion of functions, the greater a challenge that, that, that can be. It's not an insurmountable challenge by any means. The CMA's historical uh, approach to making, making markets work better for consumers, mm -hmm. uh, a, a phrase that many use is, is one way to join these together. Uh, but I think a dilemma one faces in part is that if you're very good at what you do, your legislature will give you more functions. They will give you more things to do. And then again, you have to avoid, by defining your common theme and mission, uh, you have to avoid being the 1960s go-go conglomerate that did all those things before. <laughs> so really quickly, and I think we're already at time, which is uh, amazing, but um, you would say no to those people who say, bring all these different organizations into, into one house, privacy, competition, consumer protection. I mean, I know we have it at the FTC in the United States, but we've taught, you know, there have been multiple people this week talking about that, is maybe we need to bring more things into one organization. You would say no? I'd say, I'd say both, both approaches are valid. Uh, economists would say one approach is integration by contract. That's joining yourself up with other institutions. The other integration by ownership, bringing them together. Uh, I think we're at a point where the experiment with both models is, is, is useful and valid. Uh, and, and perhaps part of what we do over time in this institution and others is use candid comparative experience to see how it's working, what works. I think the illustrations of both Rubric and Tembi used so skillfully are ways of thinking about how it took place inside individual agencies. I think that experiment can continue. I think what we can do collectively is to do some good work in assessing how you do it best, which technique might be most successful. Okay. So, and I'm gonna give um, the same question to both Tembe and Ruprecht, and we'll, we'll wrap up there. But, um, so we've heard uh, people express that we should exercise caution in going outside of our lane in the competition world. We've heard that this week, we've, we hear that all the time. Um, what do each of you say about that? Do you say, 
we'll be asleep at the switch if we exercise that caution and, and let the world move on, or do we need to think outside the box, think more broadly, and take in other issues? Tembe, you first, maybe a minute. I accept that uh, you know th there's got to be uh, uh, limits on a mandate. There is no such a thing as an endless uh, mandate, uh, particularly uh, when you have an agency that's created by a statute. So the law is very clear about that, that you may only do what the statute allows you to do if you are a creature of statute. Uh, so they, they, uh, but I think we have to go back to the adoption of competition laws uh, that, in fact, uh, they were meant to serve uh, different purposes. Uh, they have kind of organizing principles uh, they have tools, instruments, such as economics, to interpret things. But the goals are not entirely the same. The European Union uh, uh, drive for competition is very different from the United States, and, and that's very different from South Africa. Uh, and, and, and I think that we've got to be through to that. Uh, so, so, so this is what has always, I think, informed uh, debates around uh, convergence or divergence, uh, because you want to learn from others, but you want to remain true to your to your goals. And uh, in South Africa, whether we like it or not, we do have uh, goals of uh, promoting small businesses through competition law, uh, of protecting employment, uh, and 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 so on. Uh, and and this we have to uh, embed it in our competition analysis, our competition uh, process, in other words, must lead into optimum outcome for all of these, these goals. Very difficult balancing uh, exercise. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, I think that you, you beginning to see that uh, there is uh, uh, a lot of interest in this. I think the sustainability issues uh, are kind of uh, a wake-up call for everybody uh, that y y linear thinking uh, in this case, uh, a sort of single goal objective for competition law may not be sustainable. You can't say, I don't care about the environment, I'm just going to decide a competition uh, case. At least this is an aspiration of uh, many competition uh, authorities. I think that those authorities can learn from how we have integrated uh, these social goals to a competition analysis. In other words, being transparent, being clear about the law, being clear about what are the limits in, 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 in doing all of this. So I, I, I'm not an advocate for, for, for caution. I, I think that you need to uh, respect uh, the law. You need to respect the economics, the analysis, what it gives you. Uh, but you also need to remain true to your uh, original goals. Okay, thanks, Tembe. Ruprecht, what's the final verdict? Let me add two, uh, two thoughts to this, and I love what Tembe said. The first is, uh, the thing that competition authorities are really good at is identifying competition issues and working with competition issues. And if I look into the fields of privacy, consumer protection, et cetera, I often think, why don't these people, the consumer and privacy advocates, why don't they think more in the terms of competition? So this is something that we should bring in. And I think this is what, what Bill said when, when he said, what is our core brand? What, what are we really good at? We are good at an analyzing competition. And that's important for privacy and important for consumer protection. So don't forget this core capacity of what we have. And the second thing, if we turn the, the other way around and know, OK, we are modest people and we should learn from the others as well, I think that there is a lot to learn also from consumer protection and privacy, particularly in fields like remedies, um, say, smart regulation or regulation by design and stuff like that. I think that these more modern fields of regulation are a bit further advanced than we are. So it, I think it also makes sense to look into these fields and uh, think of what can we learn from people who are doing things in these fields and what can we adapt maybe for competition mm -hmm. policy. Mm -hmm. Okay, well thank you very much. Thanks to the three panelists. Um, for the, the audience, I encourage you to look out for the public agency considerations paper in the next few months. Uh, look at the ICN material that's already been prepared. There's 
obviously, uh, we've only scratched the surface here today. It's a very important issue, as we've heard throughout the week. So thank you to the Bundeskartell Amp for giving us the opportunity to discuss this uh, today and uh, hand it over to the next panel and thank our panelists, please. Thank you. Thank you.